Thank you very much and good evening. My name is Samantha Nutt. I wish I was Margaret Atwood. <laughs> this is my third walrus talks this season, all inconveniently on different subjects, which just goes to show you that I really like Shelley Ambrose a lot. Uh, <laughs> that was her laughing. <laughs> now, it is, it is really good to see so many of you here tonight. After all, I know that there are better and more important things you could be doing. For example, you could be home watching the Ford Brothers star in The Hangover 4, <laughs> The Frat and the Furious. And here I thought I was the only one building an international reputation for being a nut from Toronto. <laughs> All right, now, in the spirit of the forthcoming holidays, at a time when many of us are scrambling, to find just that perfect gift for that special someone, that little something that says, I really care about you. But I also care about the planet, about climate change and Africa and fair trade and ending war and banning sweatshops. And so this year, and this is still the gift talking, this year I am dispensing with all that blatant materialism and giving you person that I love, something that you cannot wear, eat, ride, return, or hang. Here it is, the perfect gift. I just bought you a compost, composting toilet in Guatemala, and enclosed is a picture of the happy family using it for the very first time. <laughs> That's right, nothing quite says I love you like swapping out the holiday crap for a holiday crapper. Now, if you do happen to be one of those generous people wishing to infuse a little meaning into your holidays at this time of year, then my talk this evening is for you. It is festively entitled, What Not to Give, because too often we set out and we have the very best of intentions and we mean well and we hope that we're helping, but how do we actually know? Because frankly, between the goats and the chickens and the sponsored orphans and the Borwells and the emergency kits and the microloans, which should you choose and what's likely to be most effective? And I think that these are important questions to be asking ourselves, especially this month as we have watched uh, the tragic events unfolding in the Philippines and in Syria and elsewhere. And so I think it's a very good time for us to have a conversation, a very frank and open and honest conversation about what works and what doesn't because unfortunately too many corners of the world, Haiti is a good example, too many corners of the world are plagued by our misspent altruism. And my publisher would also like me to mention that this is a subject that is explored in great detail in my book called Damnations, Greed, Guns, Armies, and Aid, which is conveniently sized to fit in stockings everywhere. <laughs> but let me begin not by answering the questions I've just posed for you, because that would be too obvious a narrative ploy. Instead, I'm going to defer to all of you in this room by asking another question, but a question of all of you, a question I hope you can answer. Demographically speaking, I'm a public health doctor, Demographically speaking, what do you think is the single most important determinant or predictor of whether a child in the developing world will live to see his or her fifth birthday? Now, how many of you would look at that question or think about that question and you would say, I think the single most important determinant or predictor is whether children have access to primary health care. Is that a good one? Vaccination programs, that kind of thing? How many of you would say, well, I think the answer would be food and water? How many of you think that? Good number of you. How many of you would say something simpler, far simpler, something like mosquito nets? After all, malaria is a significant contributor to morbidity and mortality around the world. Any of you would think that? Well, actually, more people in the developing world die from smoke inhalation related to kerosene and charcoal cook stoves than die from malaria, even though this remains a significant killer. But in fact, demographically speaking, while all of those things that I just mentioned, they do happen to be important, the single most important predictor of, global, of child mortality in the world is none of those things. What do you think it is instead? Any ideas? 
That's right. It is actually that child's mother's independent access to income, which is by extension really about education. There's a fantastic study that was published a couple of years ago in The Lancet that looked at 30 years of demographic data. It was actually sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 30 years of demographic data around children in the developing world. And guess what they found? They found that on average for every extra year of education, a girl in the global south attains every extra year of education, child mortality drops by 10%. So I'm going to say that again. For every extra year of education that girls attain, child mortality drops by 10%. So what does this mean? Well, it means that if we want our philanthropy to have a lasting impact, perhaps even a generational impact, a good place to begin is to invest in education and the economic empowerment, specifically of women and girls. But we shouldn't stop there, because after all, we know that while infant and mortality child mortality indicators are certainly important, they aren't the only ones that count. And other ones that count, for example, have to do with things like reducing the prevalence of armed conflict and poverty in the world, because as we all know, those countries that find themselves on the unfortunate end of the Human Development Index are also the same ones that are either embroiled in conflict or that recently emerged from conflict. And so if we want to support programs that address some of those challenges, issues of war and issues of poverty, well, what does that look like? Well, that looks like programs that provide skills training and economic development for young men too to reduce the appeal of militia groups and to prevent their ongoing militarization in environments where half the population is under the age of 18. Imagine that, half the population under the age of 18. It also means breaking that cycle of violence and impunity by investing in legal redress, in access to justice. So to sum up, education, opportunity, justice. And in fact, those are the areas that Warchild, which is the organization that I helped to found, has been concentrating on for the better part now of 15 years. Uh, but you know, you might rightly interject, well you won't have an opportunity to interject so I'm going to do it for you, you might say, but those kinds of things, wow, they're important but they take time. And they depend on other social and political structures that probably don't exist in those environments. And that makes it all just a little bit futile, don't you think? Nut. <laughs> and there's just something quite nice and convenient and easy and immediate about getting food to people who don't have any food, who are hungry about getting shoes to kids who don't have any shoes, and just keeping people alive in the face of war and disaster. What's wrong with just sticking to the basics, and why do we have to go and make it so complicated? But here's the thing. It's that part of the conversation when it comes to our philanthropy that unfortunately is too often missing. It's that part of the conversation that makes us just a little bit uncomfortable because it leads us down some paths to which we do not have the answers that can leave us questioning our own magnanimity and infuse us with a certain amount of cynicism. But if you remember nothing else from my presentation here this evening, I hope that you will remember this. It is complicated. And it's time for our giving to evolve to reflect this reality because good intentions simply do not guarantee good outcomes. How so? Well, consider this. The loss of hundreds of thousands of textile jobs in Africa have been directly tied to the trade of used clothing originating from our side of the world as charity endeavors. And recent psychological studies of orphaned children who are subjected to revolving doors of well-intentioned and well-meaning volunteers from our side of the world, those studies have found that those children experience recurrent trauma because of the emotional bonds that are formed and then broken with 
ever-evolving foreigners. And any development expert in the world, or indeed any parent in this room, will tell you that it is better to invest in community-based programs that support equal opportunity for all children rather than to single out one child to help or to sponsor while other kids in the household or even in that same village wonder why they weren't chosen or weren't given those relative advantages. One of my favorite quotes by Oscar Wilde is that it is much easier to have sympathy with suffering than sympathy with thought. And yet we must think because to not think is to continue rewarding the wrong things at the expense of the right ones. So what shouldn't you give? Well, it's simple. If you're supporting an international cause or responding to a humanitarian, humanitarian emergency anywhere in the world, don't give hard goods like food or clothes. It suppresses local economies. It hurts local workers, many of them already living in poverty. It won't get to them in time to be useful. And it is too expensive to ship and distribute. And if you're going to give of your time and your effort and your energy, which is extraordinarily generous, please make it effective by doing it locally. Join charity boor boards and fundraising committees and help in their offices. But unless you are a highly skilled professional with unique abilities that can be useful and relevant in a foreign context, be very careful about overseas volunteer type initiatives. Because if you really want to help overseas, especially if you intend on helping in the global south or in developing countries, the better way to invest is by creating those opportunities, fostering those opportunities for local communities to do the work themselves. And if you want to go to Africa, for example, please, by all means, do it. It is a vast and beautiful and wondrous continent. Spend your dollars in their local markets, but there is no need to go searching for that busy work philanthropy like repainting a classroom or reading to orphans. And on the question of giving to relief versus development, and I'm wrapping up here in about two minutes, certainly there are times, as with the typhoon in the Philippines, when we do need to rally support for those short-term initiatives and emergency efforts that help people survive and rebuild in a crisis. But these needs must be balanced by that broader imperative of reducing aid dependence and promoting community self-reliance over the long term. And that means being prepared to wrestle with and tackle those structural deficits I spoke about earlier in education, in justice, and in economic opportunity. Planned giving, it's pretty simple. It's just like planning for your retirement. You have to diversify your portfolio. Have local and global. Invest for today and invest for tomorrow. Because the most effective way to give is not to contribute through one-off donations. The enemy of effective aid is one thing. And that one thing is not corruption or local capacity or even insecurity. The enemy of, of effective aid is quite simply inconsistency. It is the gains that evaporate when the cameras go home and the donors drift to a new crisis and a new quick fix and a new now, even as the heartbreaking reality persists in the streets of Darfur and Afghanistan and Eastern Congo and Somalia and countless other tragedies that we so soon forget about. I can tell you that I have walked those streets. And I have walked those streets as the very big white land cruisers stop hurrying to their destinations and then just stop altogether. And I have walked those streets as the NGO logos, the non-governmental organization logos, that are blanketing every conspicuous wall as those logos begin to fade. And these become thin reminders that we used to care before it all became too complicated and too messy and exhausted our compassion. But to be honest with you, that's when the real work begins. I have spent the last 20 years of my life bearing witness to failed experiments in foreign and aid policy, our unintended consequences, and our missed opportunities. And all of these experiences have led me to one simple conclusion, 
and it's one that I hope will serve you well when you are trying to decide who and what to give to this holiday season. Don't give to charity, give to change. Thank you very much. Thank you.